Mo Monroe. He's wanted for the financial terrorist attack Black Monday. Black Monday was my idea. It's me, who is Wall Street himself. Mo is back, baby. We're excited to bring you a special episode of our brother and one of the greatest rappers of all time, Snoop Dogg. But we're here to let you know that this interview happened before the tragic passing of Kobe and Gigi and the rest of the people on January 26th. So obviously, if that would have happened, uh, the conversation would have been a lot different and uh, you know, more Kobe and more heartfelt, but this is previous. So we know how important Snoop is to the city of LA and how much he and Kobe had a great relationship and they were brothers. So we just want to give you guys that information before you guys watch this episode. And uh, we're excited about it. We're excited for you to see it. Snoop Dogg gave us a great show, a real in-depth interview, a lot of stories about Death Row. A lot of uh, energy. In, in, endless tree. A endless lot of tree weed. A lot of weed and some great stories from, uh, from the dog father. You don't want to miss it. So make sure you tap into this episode and we're smoking. So all you, all the smoke smokers, Ooh. tune in. Fumbo. Fuck with us episode of Snoop Dogg. Enjoy. All right, welcome back. All the smoke. It's been a minute, bro. You, you dry the motherfucking I'm just making sure, I'm just making sure, I'm just making sure, you know. I've, I've been doing you, good, good yeah. to see you. Man, we got a legend in the building today, man. Someone I grew up listening to, idolizing to, became a friend, mentor, OG to me. Uh, man, we want to welcome Snoop. Hey, oh, no. gee. Oh, my niggas, what's happening? The honorable. Hey, we're going to get all the smoke today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's extra comfortable, as we like everybody, but we want to get right into it, man. You came in, you're one of the you know ones that made it. You came from a street gangbanging life to a mogul, you know, worth a lot of M's. Like, talk to me what that transition was like. Well, I was telling somebody today in a meeting, I was like, imagine all of the Fortune 500 drug dealers that got locked up before marijuana was legal. Mm. Imagine how fly they would be and how sharp they would be. I'm just one of those guys that just happened to beat the system. And I take my hustle, I take my street savvy, I take my experience around people. The, the way my mother raised me, my mother raised me to love people, right? I was born in the 70s, so I was raised in the era where it wasn't about color, so I had friends that was white, Hispanic, Asian, everything. Mm -hmm. You get what I'm saying? So I was taught to love people. So when I was able to get into the music industry, I was writing music for people. I was meeting people, and I was becoming accustomed to learning what people loved, and that's what made me likable, eventually made me lovable, and that's why I'm still here, and that's why my longevity is with, within the realms of me and the people that I you know, service. That's why I'm the people's champ. So they say. Your, your mom, your mom was big in music too, right? Oh man, music, please believe well. it, man. Mom sung in the church, led the choir, did all that good stuff, and you know my whole family was connected to music, but nobody actually made that breakthrough to actually like get a big deal and become a big star. They was like a lot of writers, a lot of behind the scenes, a lot of artists that was connected to my family, but I was like the first one to actually break the mold. But it's the years of them not making it, mm -hmm. which was the spirit of me pushing through. Right. They paid the dues. Come on, man. Yeah. You know, you can't do it without the forefathers and the, the grandmothers and the people that did it before you to gave you the foundation. Just their prayers alone. Man, that goes a long way. <laughs> See, but Jack, yeah. they don't understand when they say I'm praying for you how serious that Real, is. Yeah. Like, we really be needing that. Like, mm -hmm. I always say to everybody, parents or everybody that that's, has people in their life that's older, that always say, I'm praying, tell your friend Snoop Dogg I'm praying for him. I appreciate that. Yep. And I tell people all the time, you wonder why people, especially our generation, be so hurt when our grandmothers die because that's the only people we feel like that we know that was praying for us every day. All the time. They told us that every day, I'm praying for Man, you. Man, granny was that on my head about praying for me. And then when I come to see her, she had Jimmy Swagger on 24-7. <laughs> yeah, she was yeah. dumping boatloads of money in Jimmy's pot. You understand? <laughs> Jimmy Swagger got to raise $3 million every day, baby. Swagger. Three million? Yeah, Swagger. What? <laughs> yes, sir. Shout out Jimmy Swagger, bro. Hey, let's take a uh, real small chronic break real quick, man. We appreciate you because 
You didn't this, say that right, Matt. You got to say, can we have a moment of silence for this small crime break? break? There you go, legendary. <laughs> legendary. <laughs> Only you can say that, though. Exactly. We, that, that was your tone, but, you know, because that's how we wanted to come into, and it didn't initially work out. But, you know, when I said we, you know, we got Snoop online, but we're going to have to be able to... To so blow it, one for the poor one. Yeah. So it took a little finessing, but, you know, shout out Brian. Brian made that happen. Brian B. made it happen? We appreciate you, Oh, Brian. Lion shout Brian. B. 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 He finally came through. Lion Brian came through. Be on us down, man. Be on us down. Appreciate you, B. But anyway, back, you've been someone that's been able to, I guess, connect different worlds, almost uh, uh, someone who's a, a, a bridge builder between the streets <laughs> and business through football and, 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 and the communities, uh, music, uh, and it goes on. Where did you learn how to bridge those gaps and, and bring all these different people together? You know what, MB? I think it became uh, something that grew on me. I think it was always in me. It just grew on me as far as like the, like my arms and my legs, something that I move with every day. It grew on me like that to where it was something I had to move with every day. Cause I come from violence. I come from negativity and hate and fuck them niggas and bitch ass niggas and we ain't supposed to be cool with them niggas. And I come from that energy. Mm -hmm. So me making it was, if I make it, I want the niggas that don't post to like me to like me. Mm -hmm. Let me write something that they gonna like. Let me do something that they gonna like. I may offend my neighborhood more than offending your neighborhood because I'm stepping outside of the box and breaking a chain of negative energy and I'm bringing people together who would have never came together. Mm -hmm. And it's by coincidence, it's by the, gl the glory of God that Death Row Records was built off of Bloods and Crips. Because prior to that, there was no communication with Bloods and Crips. Like our communication was like, nigga, what's happening? What's up? Disrespect on every level. So when Death Row Records came about, it forced us to communicate and to collaborate and to be around each other. Mm -hmm. And either nigga man up or, 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 or hoe up, mm -hmm. or hoe, show up, nigga, ain't no in-betweens. You have to get down or lay down. Mm -hmm. Cause it was always somebody aggressive there, but it taught us how to be better people. Mm -hmm. And like, man, I like these niggas. Let me, man, y'all, you, you like the same cereal I like, nigga. You, you like good times, <laughs> nigga. You like, nigga, all the shit I like, you like. Like, you know what, it's like, you know what, it's a stereotype that we gotta break. And I was just willing to be the nigga that just was like, Fuck it. In the beginning on Death Row, Suge used to get mad at me because I used to hang with his homies too much. Meaning that, not like like mad, mad, but like, nigga, you going all in the hood with this nigga and buying dogs and doing all kind of shit with this nigga. This nigga's a killer. Mm -hmm. So, and yeah. you brought him around me. Yeah. Right. Like, that's what I'm supposed to do. I ain't supposed to be a shell, nigga. I'm supposed to get out and move around. And I moved around and I became a peaceful motherfucker because I seen that we was all alike and I seen I had power. And I seen when I walked in the room, people listen and people react different. So instead of me being the nigga that's like, get that nigga, get that nigga. I was like, hey, go get that nigga. Mm -hmm. Go get that nigga, come here. What's happening? What y'all tripping off of? Man, y'all both got love. Man, quit, man, get this nigga a hug. Get this nigga your number, quit playing, nigga. We all family. You use your shot call in a positive way. Right. Never seen before. Mm -hmm. Always the other way. Mm -hmm. Have you, you know, ran into any kind of trouble with that? Any, any always, pushback? Always, because that's considered a soft. Actually, me and Tupac, our clash was that. Because remember when Tupac got out. You was on a different path at I that was, time. When he got out, I was fighting a murder case. Yeah. That's different than, nigga, what's happening, yeah, nigga? That's totally different. But if you ain't going through it, it ain't. Yeah, know. yeah. And if you young... You don't know. It looked like stripes. Mm -hmm. It looked like, oh, nigga, that's what you're supposed to do. Nigga, come mm -hmm. on, let's get back in this shit. Because mm -hmm. that's the kind of nigga he was. Mm -hmm. Like, nigga, I take my stripes and get back, and that's the kind of nigga I was until that happened. Because a life was lost. It's different. You get what I'm saying? So I was emotionally attached to that, and I couldn't find myself being mad at niggas no more and having beef. And he wanted me to not like certain niggas and they like, fuck them niggas. And I was like, no. Mm -hmm. They didn't do nothing to me. That's how a real man stand, though. If you, don't like, if, he's some, if you don't like somebody, I don't like them either. But at the same time, if it's somebody I don't know and they got beef, I'm not going to jump on the side because I know one of them. Watch I would try this. To, Let me yeah, give you a better scenario. Situation. This is different. Us three. You Pac, you Biggie, I'm Snoop. 
we all friends at the same time. We didn't hung out at the same time. Mm -hmm. We didn't smoke weed, chop it up about bitches and all kind of shit. 93, 94. Then, cuz go to jail. Cuz get out, cuz get shot. Now he tripping on cuz, but I go and see cuz and they don't do nothing to me and everything is cool with me and I'm leveling it out like I don't think cuz did that to you. Mm -hmm. Then I say, hey, Suge, put cuz with us, get him with us, now he with us. Now he really want me to ride on him. Yeah. When I could be the hold on, let me show you that he didn't do it. Mm -hmm. Mm. But niggas didn't want to hear that. Mm -hmm. Fuck that. He did it and shook, pushing right with him. Yeah, he did it and fucked them niggas. Mm -hmm. When it's like, nah, nah, nah. I can get us all in the room when we can get some understanding. Mm -hmm. Cause I think we'd be better making money mm -hmm. together. These imagine? niggas is rapping just like us. Mm -hmm. They imagine? taking the same stuff. They really are little homies. Yeah, yeah. Stop pressing and learn how to be partners. She can be beneficial. Can you imagine Big Pac and Snoop all on something? And on they the wanted album. that. Y'all wanted it too. I wanted it. Sh Pac and Suge didn't oh, want it. At one point, Pac wanted it because he, he, him and Biggie was the tightest friends. Before he got on death row. Before he got on death row. Was that almost, a, would you say almost a battery in his back? He was just out. Nigga, it's some footage of Tupac bringing Biggie to a L.A. party, nigga. We was all rapping on the mic. Mm -hmm. Warren G was on first. Biggie, me, DOC was there. It was the event that Tupac brought that nigga to. Mm. And we didn't know cuz at the time. We was looking at this big old fat nigga rapping like, this nigga hard as a motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> but cuz he was with Pac. It was cool. It was love. Shout out DOC. I'm from Texas, so you know I don't know about Come on, nigga, that's my mentor, nigga. That's my sensei, nigga. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. the God, nigga. Yeah. I'm his voice. <laughs> know that. Yes, sir. So your break into the game, really, uh, you know, was when you pulled up on the chronic and, and, and really changed the world. How did you and Dre make that connection? DJ Warren G. Um, Warren G was a Snoop Dogg fanatic. Like, he loved Snoop Dogg more than Snoop Dogg. He believed in me more than anybody. So whenever I would make cassettes and shit like that, he would always try to get my cassettes in the right hands of people. and. He just was like a, a just the, the worst nigga, but the best nigga. First cousin? I ain't related to him nah, at all. Okay. But him and Dre, him and Dre was uh, stepbrothers. Okay. <clears throat> so he pressing the line, pressing the line. So he could always go to NWA functions. They had a bachelor party one night. So Warren G goes to the bachelor party with our cassette. Music stopped. He throw the cassette in. Mm. The cassette banging. Everybody at the party like, who is that? He like, that's my own boy Snow. So the next day, Dr. Dre called and like, nigga, I like what was on the tape. Come to the studio. So I come to the studio and record a song. I bring Nate Dogg when we record a song called Gangsta's Life. That's the first thing we did. And he was like, he's starting a label and this and that. And we just started bonding. I started coming to the studio every day, no money, just every day, writing, 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 till we finally just like, we caught a motherfucking hit. He had moved me into his house, and the deep cover soundtrack it came about, and he mm -hmm. was like, I need a song for this soundtrack. Mm -hmm. I'm finna go to the gym. When I get back, I need the song to be done. I'm like, well, what's the movie about? What's the soundtrack about? He's like, shit, uh, he called the company. It's about an undercover cop selling, uh, somebody selling dope to an undercover cop. And I'm like, damn, I got caught for selling dope to an undercover <laughs> cop. That's how I went to jail. Right. So I'm like, all right, cool, I got it. I'm like, how you want it to start off? He like. I want my first lines to be, tonight's the night I get in some shit. Deep cover on the incognito tip. That's how you want to start off? All right, cool. Tonight's the night I get in some shit. Deep cover on the incognito tip. Yeah. Killing motherfuckers if I have to. Pilling cap tubes, let you niggas know I'm coming at you. Mm. I guess it's part of the game. But I feel for the nigga who think he just going to come and change things with the swiftness. So get it right with the quickness and let me handle my business, yo. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Classic. So that's the first song y'all, you and Dre did together. That's the first song that we put out. We recorded G Thing before that. Oh, did you? Okay, that's what yeah, I wanted. Yeah, but I had a motherfucking toothache, and I went and got some <laughs> pills for my auntie and violated my probation. And had to go to jail for like four months. For real. So that prolonged that shit. Yep. So y'all shot G Thing, then you got locked up. We recorded G Thing uh -huh. first, uh -huh. then I got locked up, then I got out, and then we did Deep Cover, and Deep Cover came out first. 
And then we re-recorded G Thing once my shit had got healed. <laughs> Cause my voice was like fucked up, but once my shit had got healed, my shit was crisp as a motherfucker. I heard that shit in, in my earphone. I'm like, this nigga Dr. Dre is the shit, cuz. My shit sounded clean, like one, two, three, and to the four. That shit was like crystal clear. Because remember, I was rapping on bullshit ass equipment before I meet this nigga. So imagine a nigga on a Walkman, then all of a sudden they get some beats by Dre. Yeah. You know yeah. what I'm saying? To hear yeah. your voice like that, it's like, oh man, this shit is mind blowing. Then at the same time, it's like DOC is right here. Mm. And the nigga, the, the rap was so dope, the nigga only helped me with four lines. And normally when I was writing, like before that, he would be helping me with everything. He'd be like, no, nah, you got to move this, move this around over there. You got to put that verse over there and put that <laughs> over there. That's like it. And, and that got to go right there, doggy dog. You got to... You gotta cut this shit out right here. That's, ain't nobody gonna say that shit. And this right here, and when they put that right there, doggy dog. When I did G thing, that nigga just said one line. Mm. He was like, we had got to the end, and nigga got stuck. He was like, like this, that, and this, this and uh, it's like that. And that's like, okay, cool. That's all I need, cause he uh. gave me that one motherfucking line, and that shit ended that shit. Cause it's like my nigga D go see, no yeah. one could do it better. And I was yeah. stuck. He was like. Like this, that, and this, and that. Because it was about the way, the, the, the cadence. Yeah. Because we was already saying like this and like that, but he was saying like this, that, and, and this, this, and that. Yeah. He dragged Cadence. It. Yeah. That nigga had cadence. Killed it. That's that Texas shit. D.O.C. <coughs> Them niggas the moved diggy, to a different diggy drum. The y'all. <coughs> Them Texas niggas moved to a different drum. Yeah, we're a little slower. You better know it. Yeah, we're That drum slower. is on, that motherfucker's on time now. So that put you on the map, obviously. <clears throat> What's it like going from being a, a, a hood superstar to a real up-and-coming star? How do you handle that? Wow. Um, the first phase is the, uh, the show The Box. I don't know if y'all remember that show where you could order videos oh, yeah. like, all Ch day. Channel 23. Yeah, nigga, you could yep. order it and they tell you the next one that's coming. So Jukebox, and then they called it The Box. Yes. I remember that shit. So yeah. I didn't have nowhere to stay at the time. G-Thing was popping. So I spent a night at my cousin's house. She lived in Pacoima, and Pacoima is all bloods. So <laughs> she lived in an apartment, too, in some ghetto. At, like the apartment builder's own baby boy that yeah. Yvette live in. Yeah. <laughs> nigga, she living the same kind of shit, nigga, upstairs. So I'm upstairs sleeping, shit. I wake up in the morning, and the video just coming on back to back to back. That motherfucker G thing came on like 12 times in a row. Like nothing else but that, just because you, whoever you ordered it just come. Yeah, yeah that motherfucker just came on. I'm like, damn, this motherfucker popping. I hear a bunch of niggas downstairs. I'm like, damn, I ain't got no gun. I'm at my cousin's house. She a female. But one of the niggas that's the leader is her baby daddy. Oh, uh, okay. So so it's connected some kind of way. Come on, my nigga. It's you know got to be go. a reason a nigga went to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> so the baby daddy come up in that motherfucker. He like, he look at me. He want a trip, but he can't because the music is banging so hard. He like, hey, blood. That, that music you got with Dr. Dre, that shit hard. I'm like, good looking, cuz. And then it was like a, a, a weird, because remember, I'm telling you, this is when Bloods and Crips yeah, really wasn't no like. War. So when he's saying Blood, and I'm saying, cuz, this is still me, like, nigga, still yeah. like. Yeah. Because now it would be like, hey, homie. Hey, dog. It yeah. wouldn't be no, hey, Blood. Yeah. Hey, cuz. But back then, that's what it was. So it was like an evil look off. And then he looked at me and he was like, me and my homeboys, we fuck with you. You good while you over oh, here. That's what's up. And I was like, all right. That's when I knew that my music had Powerful. prevailed to the point to where I'm in a neighborhood where niggas could have my head, but the music means more, mm -hmm. and they want to keep me around because they want to hear what else I can do. You telling their story. That's heavy. That's that language, though. Yeah. That's that language. Right. But to even be in their hood right. showed a lot. I'm like, what the nigga even doing up there? That's his, that's his relative, blood. That's all I'll keep here. That's his relative. This is my cousin. She ain't tell me she live in a blood neighborhood. <laughs> it's 7 in the morning. I got to figure out how I'm getting the fuck out of here now. <laughs> and I got to walk downstairs. And I got on all blue. I can't even change. <laughs> nigga, ain't nothing to change into. Fuck it. <laughs> what's happening? That's nigga? what it is. What's happening, yeah, nigga? Yeah. With no peace, though. What's happening, yeah. nigga? That's what it is. <clears throat> so we finally get to... 93, and where you drop your own album. Right. Take me to that and just where you were. So you, how old were you in, at that point? 22? 20, yep. Just, now my record came out in November. I had just turned 22. Mm. 
Yeah. Um, well, the Chronic album was like, that shit didn't feel like my record, but right. everybody was trying to make it like, nigga, this your album. I'm like, man, I don't think like that. This Dr. Dre shit. Like, I'm just happy to be a part of it. Facts. But when I got done with my record, it was a different kind of feeling because it was like, with Dre record, every nigga in America was bumping it. When my record, white people was playing it. Mm. And that was crazy because it was like, I always made music for everybody, but just to see the white kids coming up to me, like, loving me. Like, it wasn't no fake shit. It wasn't no, like, we just like him. They like, we love you, and our parents don't even want us to listen to your fucking music, and we're fucking listening to it. And anyway. They come to concerts, and they rocking out, and diehards. It gave me a different perspective on who I was and what I was supposed to be doing. You know, I'm in the beginning, you know, you're going to be making, I'm making records for my niggas. I'm making records for the hood. Mm -hmm. But now it's like, hold on, I'm bigger than that. I got to make records for people and for the whole world. That's how I was raised anyway, going back to my mm -hmm. mama, going back to that circle. Yeah. You know, your upbringing is what you're going to become when you become a grown man. You know, shout out to all of the great mothers mm -hmm. that raised great men that don't get credit. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Because a lot of these great men had great women in their lives that, shaped and molded them and gave us something concrete to stand on. That shit is crazy. That's deep. That's facts though, right? <laughs> That's deep. When I say Master P, what does that mean to you? Harriet Tubman. Mm. Underground Railroad. Mm -hmm. Um this nigga was the he hottest nigga. He freed a lot of motherfuckers. Boy, you didn't ain't lying. He? Boy. Man, you know I'm from that's five hours Boy, from me where I grew up. So did he? So nigga freed a Was a nigga Harriet? Man. And was giving them life, right? That's a great way to put it, too. Ooh, bro. He gave us life, man. And he put us all together. He freed us all and put us together because he knew our energy would match. And we all was there for each other. It was like an all-star team he built. And when he brought me over, I feel like I was like the first, you know, free agency in hip-hop to actually execute a championship. <laughs> a lot of niggas, you know what I'm saying? You think about that's real shit. I'm being honest with you, nigga. I, to, uh, to I have to say it because ain't nobody right. going to say that's it for true. me, nigga. That's I true. went from winning championships with Death Row to No Limit as the team that was winning it all. They was the motherfucking Warriors, nigga. They was mm -hmm. doing it. Yeah. And I jumped right in and plugged right on. Oh, KD. Right on Seamless. in. I plugged right in. Get my three in. Yep. Did my three years. And then guess what I did when I finished with those three? Eastsiders. Doggy Style Records and the Chronic 2001. Mm. Back to another championship mm -hmm. with my righteous owner. Yep. With the nigga that, yes, that I play with the best. Yeah. But he got a new team now. He got Eminem. Yeah. Yeah. He got 50 Cent. Yeah. Yeah. He got all these pieces. But remember, I'm the G. Mm -hmm. So what do I do? I groom them. Mm -hmm. That's why they respect they G now. And they all big dogs now. Eminem's a goon in the game. 50 Cent, tycoon in the game. Mm -hmm. And they respect Snoop Dogg the same way they did when they first came in, no matter how big they get. You gave them a game. From the get-go, I wasn't too big to say hello. Mm -hmm. A lot of niggas get too big to say hello. You know, when you so big and fucking with that nigga, no, nah, you better, because he may take your spot one day. Mm -hmm. He may be the one, not the two. Mm. Yeah. Cause 50 is an executive now. Niggas on ABC. Mm -hmm. Straight up. <laughs> Hello. Speaking America's of, broadcast channel. Speaking nigga. of a ABC, uh, let's try and uh, move over to your uh, film career. You got a lot of movies. You play yourself a lot, but you're in a lot of movies. Starsky and Hutch, which is one of my favorite movies. I laugh at that shit so you much. You know that nigga, really, uh, that nigga really hit me in real life in Starsky and Hutch? I'm, I'm going to take you to the scene. It was the golf course scene. Yeah. <clears throat> me yeah. and Vince Vaughn. So when we rehearsing, we rehearsing in the scene, it says, well, Vince is going to say a line, and then Snoop's character, Huggy Bear, is going to interrupt him, and Vince is going to say, hey, don't you interrupt me. So, okay, me and the director, Todd Phillips, we get an understanding, so it's time to shoot. So now we on set, so nigga like, and action. The nigga saying his lines, I'm all ready and doing my shit. The nigga say something, I'm like, hey, man, that nigga said, he slapped the dog shit out of me. No way. <laughs> nigga on my mama. <laughs> he slapped the dog shit out of me. So the, the nigga in me was finna punch him, right? But the actor in me... <laughs> <laughs> I sold it. You <laughs> sold it. The actor in me was like... 
And I shrugged it off and I went to my next line and I did that uh. shit and I killed your nigga and they was like, eh, cut nigga. Everybody started clapping. And the nigga Vince Vaughn hugged me tight as a motherfucker and said, man, don't hit, don't kill me, man. I just felt the urge, man. I just felt like, I said, you felt the urge, you dog head motherfucker, you. He felt the that urge. That nigga slapped the shit out of me, cuz. <laughs> Oh my god. That's what happens bro. when you're on the set of a movie and you're working with real actors. Shit like that just happens. I said, I don't want to be on more, no more real actors. Put me with some niggas, man. Put me on some soul nigga. Kevin Hart is Kevin Hart is some motherfucking body. <laughs> but what's it like to, like I said, so you're transitioning <laughs> from the streets to a, a global superstar, and then now you fucking around. Now you in movies. Like, what, tell me what's, what's going through your mind during this time, Matt. You know what's crazy? Because I always, from church, my auntie, dad's mama, my auntie Eileen, in church, she used to always put us in plays. She used to always put us in theatrical shit where we have to either play characters or memorize lines or be somebody famous for Black History. Benjamin Banneker, uh, 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 James Washington Carver. All kind of motherfuckers that we had, Frederick Douglass, we had to do research on these people, then we have to become them, and we have to act like them, and we have to present that. Then when I went to school, I did like certain things in school that, certain classes that I took that would give me the opportunity to, to give a little bit of that. Then when I became a rapper, rappers had personality when I came out. All of them. It was never a dead, dull rapper. Niggas couldn't just be, yeah, yeah, hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. Niggas had personality, <laughs> they had look, they had style, they had all that shit that was like flamboyant. Mm -hmm. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like that shit. So it's like when I got a chance to act, I was like, I never went to acting school, but I'm not going to blow the opportunity. And my reputation is, and you can ask anybody that's ever worked with me on a movie set is, Snoop Dogg comes to the set and he knows. Your lines, your lines, your lines, and his lines. And the motherfucker is flawless. Mm -hmm. I just did a movie with Eddie Murphy, nigga. And I ain't bragging. I'm just giving you some facts. Nigga, when we first hit the set, this the first day. Nigga say, action. Shroom. My nigga say, hold on, let me do that one more time. Action. One more time. Ah, damn, Snoop Dogg, you got a nigga rattled. Damn, nigga, you supposed, I'm supposed to be rattled by you. Mm -hmm. You understand me? Boom. Knock it out the park. whoop de woo 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 Come back to the thing like, nigga, you a professional, nigga, the way you. And I'm, to me, I ain't did nothing but just what I'm supposed to you, do. Right. Me and you. But to an onlooker and a motherfucker that's been doing this shit for a long time, the way I do it with ease and the way I get it done, it's like, nigga, this is what you meant to do. Like certain niggas on the b ball court, they just gifted. Yeah. Like some niggas got to practice and shit, and all this lifting weights and all this extra shit. And some niggas just like. What lift you doing right there? What lift was that? That's the dunk on a nigga. In there. <laughs> 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 some niggas just got to do more than others. You right, know what I'm right, saying? And then right. some niggas just naturally got it, man. Like it's just like that. Like I look at y'all, the niggas that made it to the NBA, right? How many motherfuckers didn't make it that was better than y'all? Tons. I know a lot of my partners made it, most of them in jail. They were way colder than me. That's what I'm saying. It's just a matter of the way you did it at ease. Mm -hmm. And I had the favor. But you did it at ease, too. Yeah, yeah. The favor gonna give it to you, but you still gotta do it at ease. Because yeah. if you do it reckless, then you're gonna lose favor. Yeah, I almost fucked it off a couple of times. We all almost did. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we're sitting right here, nigga. We perfect combination. Right. What was the best... Acting experience or people you got to work with, you felt was it? You just spoke on what was that? Probably coming to America too. You was talking about? Nah, Dolomite. Oh, okay, okay, That's Dolomite. Right. But the people that I had the great experience of working with, one of them was Fred Williamson. That's the Hammer. Yeah. Played in Sham. Super Bowl one. Mm -hmm. Yep. Played in Super Bowl one. He was in Starsky and Hutch too. He was yeah, the, uh, the lieutenant. Yeah, yeah, lieutenant. But he told me because <clears throat> I had a long conversation with him, and um, I was like, Fred, I really want to start doing this acting thing heavy, what should I, you know, do or what should I request or whatnot? Because I just want to be good at what I do. He said, look here, young man, let me tell you something. When I started making movies, it was three things that had to happen or I wouldn't fuck with the movie. Got to win all my fights. I got to win all my fights. That's number one. Got to fuck all the pretty girls. I'm going to get you sucker. That's what he That's played. That's number man. two. Yeah. 
and I got to live. All three of them things got to happen in a movie for me to be in them. And I looked at every movie this nigga was in, and it's the same shit. Yeah. Yeah. That nigga beating up niggas from the beginning, yeah. fucking a bad bitch in the middle, yeah. and that nigga lives at the end. Yeah. And now in that time and era, <laughs> but just listen to lying. me. In that nah, time and era, fly. in real life, nigga would get beat up. We gonna take you, bitch, mm-hmm. and you're dead by the end of the movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get these are three things that's happening right. to you, black actors. Yeah. Get that part in your head. Right. You gonna die. So somebody had to create a stigma of hold on. Mm-hmm. We want to uh, see some superheroes that look like us. Yeah, yeah. That's where the superfly and the shafts mm-hmm. and the black dynamites and the mm-hmm. dolomites, that's where they come from. Because it had to be somebody to set the trend on, you're not going to do me like that. Mm-hmm. Or I'm not going to be in it. Mm-hmm. So that's why when I got to a certain point of doing movies, I pulled back from Hollywood because they always wanted to kill a nigga. Mm-hmm. They wanted me to die in the movie. The last movie I died in, me and John Singleton had an understanding. It was like, look, I really don't want to die in no more movies, cuz, cuz I just don't like the, the spirit of that shit. I mm-hmm. like to live. Mm-hmm. He was like, nigga, the way you gonna die in this movie, nigga, you gonna live forever. <laughs> <laughs> and what was I to do? <laughs> nigga Rodney from Baby Boy, the nigga yeah, lives yeah, forever. Yeah, yeah. I like a lot of your movies, like you got 13 appearances where you play yourself. Is, right. is that easier? The cameos is harder. Yeah. Because what you don't want to do is you don't want to do the same shit twice. Like I could play me, but I I could I got different versions of me. Mm-hmm. So you seen me in Reincarnated, which is the reggae version of me. Then you seen me in the Bible of Love, which is the gospel me. Mm-hmm. You seen me in Coach Snoop, which is the coach version of me. You seen me in some gangster shit shooting a nigga. You seen me in some pimp shit. So it's like it's different versions of me that I can give you, but I gotta know when. Nah. I can't do that. Mm-hmm. That ain't cool. Nah. Because it was one movie that I just got that they wrote it for me to play Snoop Dogg. But I changed it up and made my name Lingerie. <laughs> because he was more <laughs> profound for what I was doing. You dig? <laughs> and it paid off. He said, and it paid off. Got some writer credit. Oh, shit. You got to know how to mix and match this shit, Jack. You know what I'm talking about? But you know what, gonna do what you play. touched on is crazy, though, because oh, there shit. are so many different versions of you, and you get paid for every different version of who you are. You've touched the gospel realm. You've touched the reggae realm. You've touched the gangster rap realm. You've touched the family comedy. Like, you've done all that. You, you showed the eight or nine different sides, but... All them people always have a lot of different sides, but they don't get paid for every motherfucking side they got. You get paid for every side you got. He also won MVP of the uh, the Adidas hey, man. Celebrity Game man. Twenty and Twenty. Hey Jack, I do this basketball shit. Hey, I, 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 I got to give you props. They don't they don't talk about that. You probably was one of the oldest there. All them young entertainers yeah. was there. You got a dub dub on them, and you got the win. Yeah, but you know what it is? They scared of me on that ESPN Celebrity Basketball shit. They be always having them weenies out there and all them. <laughs> Weak ass weed. who don't really who? politicians and motherfuckers that don't get down, nigga. And they had one nigga that's good going out there putting up 25. I'm like, nigga, put some real niggas out there, man. Quavo had a good game at his yeah, spot. That, yeah. was our, our yeah. that motherfucker. That was our legend shit. Shout out Come legend. On, Shout nigga. out Quavo. Yeah. Quavo, Quavo the shit, nigga. That, that young nigga the shit. You hear me? Yeah. Like, I give props to niggas that deserve it. That young nigga the shit, man. He put together some fly shit where niggas was out there competing and getting it in. You know what I'm talking about? Like, come on, man. That's how it's supposed to be. But Snoop came, in the, came to the game. Played in some Pulled high, up. Top, high top chucks. What I played in, some of these, nigga. High top chucks. Put it up and left, came, nigga. Came, killed for like, what, 10 minutes? Yeah, then left. And left. You that was it. Mean? Next thing you know, people's like, where's Snoop at? My chucks had ran out of gone. gas. <laughs> <had to> go <laughs> shit was on the flat. <laughs> now, nah, but he came in instantly. You must have stressed in, 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 in the sprinter. Come on, you, hey. You know what I mean? You MB, know you can't just jump don't in the stretch, gas. <laughs> man. We in ready. The came in. Came we in the game late. Like, killed and bounced. We ready. You know, we, we keep you loose, man. We keep it really you loose. Do, you ain't got to stretch. It really do. Classic. Tell me what it's like working with Martha Stewart. Oh, man. Martha Stewart, she's like... A real one. Your coolest auntie, man, right? You know, like when your mom drop you off and be like, I'm taking you to your auntie house to stay over there for a couple of days. You be like, oh, thanks, mom. This is the coolest motherfucking auntie. She going <laughs> to let bitches come over. She going <laughs> to cook for a nigga. She going to, man, you know what I'm saying? Like, just cool, cool, cool. Like... But at the same time, she's real educational. 
So if I'm doing something wrong or if I'm out of etiquette, she always gets me back in order and puts me back in place. And But if I'm doing something right, she's quick to compliment me and give me all of the love that I need. So her spirit is genuine, it's beautiful, and just you would have never thought. But if you really know good people, you would have always thought that we deserve each other. It's just like any other two people that you may not know. Put them in a room together, let them, let them talk and see what happens. Pretty sure they love the same things and they... Probably the best of friends if you let them communicate. Mm -hmm. Shout out Martha Stewart, man. She went sat down and did her time like a real one. Yeah, she said six nines a bitch. Yeah, shout out Martha, man. Yeah, because he told me she don't know nothing. Yeah. She hear no evil, see no evil. She ain't tell nothing. She Martha said, take nothing. these two and uh, put them behind my back. You did. You did. <laughs> Pull up, Martha. You welcome on all the smoke anytime. Anytime. Yeah, Bring some uh, some uh, some of that infused <clears throat> food. Yeah. yeah. Infused <laughs> What's the challenges? The challenges from transitioning to gangster rap to being like a global star. Like me personally, like being, come, being a basketball player. Like a lot of people in here don't even know half the shit I've been through. You know what I mean? As far as I'm, perfect example. I'm probably the only basketball player in history that went got nine hard. I just pot in the house while the house getting raided. Mm. See what I'm saying? So I know you seen, you seen, we seen different shit than a lot of people don't see. You know what I'm saying? So being growing up in that, then becoming this global star, going around the world, doing how, how did that transition? Like, was it hard? It was real hard because it's not you all the time. It's the company you keep. <clears throat> and a lot of times when we make it, we like to bring everybody with us. And this shit ain't for everybody. Right. And we got to learn the hard way sometimes, you know. We get lawsuits, we get certain things that happen based off of the company that we keep. So we got to learn how to separate and elevate at the same time. Some of them people that you bring definitely deserve to be there and going to roll with you, but it's got to be about you first. Yeah. You got to get your game together, and then once you get your life right and get situated and organized, then you can start plugging and playing everybody else that's important in your life. And... That usually is the wrong thing that we do. We try to plug everybody else up before we get our own feet planted and end up losing it all because somebody did something where you got to end up paying a loss or you got to do this, you got to help this and help that when you didn't have nothing to do with nothing. Yeah, I, you know, I, I learned everybody ain't meant to benefit off your blessing. Right. You know what I'm saying? We, 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 got, we, grow, with, we grow up with big hearts and we grow up with big families and we taught to love and try to take care of everybody. But on the way to success... You find out the hard way that that ain't the way to do it. You want to pull up everybody up, but everybody ain't meant to benefit out your blessing. And we learn that the hard way. Well, I like to use LeBron James as a great example of how he put niggas to work. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> he gave them a spot, but he gave them the, you had to work. We didn't do that. We gave our homeboys a sack. And a job. Yeah. And we gave them the money. Yeah. We gave them the bag. Money and weed. Y'all ain't got to do nothing. Oh, you security. Right. You ain't securing shit. <laughs> Running niggas off, running my fans off. Yeah. Like, come on, man. Like, we got to be better than that. Like, LeBron did a good thing. He taught how to, like, self-empower. Like, they don't even need him no more. Mm -hmm. Like, he, that's how it's supposed to be. He did it the right way. Like, how do you not need me? Because mm -hmm. I went and put my foot down off of what you gave me. But that's why he got he's so respected by athletes, basketball, you know, uh, rappers, everybody, because he did it the right way. So many of us, me personally... I brought a whole bunch of homeboys with me when I first came into the league and was thinking that same idea LeBron was thinking, but we didn't have the game plan. Right. We didn't have the blueprint. You know right. what I'm saying? We didn't, we didn't have the smarts. And to be honest, we didn't have the intelligence. No way. You know what I'm saying? We, we was two in the street. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? We, 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 we still had that nigga, that, that nigga mentality. Right. You know what I'm saying? Too so attached to the bullshit. Yeah, so, so, so to see him do it, that's why I give him so many props because I know so many people came along and, and, and couldn't get it done. That's, you got to give him props because he's the blueprint. Yep. I mean, that's the way you want to do it. Like, as an old dog, I can look at his blueprints and say, I'm going to take a couple pages out of your book, King. Do you mind? Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? Right. Like that. And that's how it's learning. supposed to be. Always right. Learning. You can always teach an old dog a new trick if he's willing to listen. Right. Bow wow. Mm -hmm. So creating basically a whole genre of music in the 90s, to what music is today. I heard you speak on another podcast. Shout out to uh, Arian Foster. Shout out Arian. Dope, dope interview. You talked about wanting to be a com the commissioner Bobby Fino. of this thing. Where do you feel the state of music was from the rules and the way the game used to be to what is that now? I think it's just less structure because it's so easy access, meaning that anybody can get in. Like it used to be a time where to be a musician, you had to have everything, look, um, 
communication skills, dance, um, talent, talent. <laughs> I mean, I mean, not to mention. I mean, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> But it was things that, that, that were a part of your criteria that had to come with the package in order for you to even get listened to by anybody that was serious. And then it became a, a point where you could do it yourself. But then you start watering it down when you got so many people doing it themselves who've never been trained, who don't know the, the understanding of the dynamics of what music is. So now that anybody and everybody can do it, there are no rules or regulations. That's why motherfuckers can come in the game and be hot and then turn snitch and still be liked. Mm -hmm. What the fuck? Who raised you niggas? Like, what the fuck kind of shit is a rat? Don't y'all watch movies? Yeah, niggas, niggas with cheese don't like rats. Man, please. I despise. I need some decon. <laughs> Remember Muhammad Ali had that decon. <laughs> <laughs> the trap a motherfucking rat. <laughs> it's a new time, man. It's insane. Ooh. But then if you speak on it, you a hater. Right. Like, because you don't understand his fan base. What, he got a bunch of rats, nigga? What's happening? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> what goes with this shit here, man? I mean, I'm not even going to try to understand it. I'm just going to stick to the rules and regulations that apply to me. And my G code, mm -hmm. and just continue to do what I'm doing, and you know, I know that it will stand the test of time because I've stood the test of time, and that's why I've been able to because I, I go by the golden rule. I do me. I mean, to me, rap music is so influential that what you guys were rapping about back in the day, people were doing. Now, what they're rapping about is these pills and these heavy drugs, getting kids uh, addicted. And then people are dropping off, artists and their fans. Like, what is your thought about the way the drug game is glorified in, in current music? Well, remember, <laughs> when I got in, crack cocaine was at a high. So what my mission was, was to make this the forefront and to kill crack. Because I sold crack, and I seen the effects of what it did and how it really... It, it, fucked a lot of my homies up. Homies and bitches and everybody, it just fucked them all the way up. Mm -hmm. So I was like, let's push this and put this in the universe and make it a, a, a better world. And it did. Like, everybody was on weed. Like, it's legalized now. Right. You're welcome. Thank you. From the chronic to here. So our energy was, get them off of that and get them on this and get everybody communicating. Because one thing about this, it brings all of us together. Look at all the people in this room right now mm -hmm. on a fucking weed show. Everybody feeling good, too. I know I am. But everybody <laughs> loving their job, <laughs> though. Like, this ain't one of them tense jobs where you like, I got to go fucking work with <laughs> Stephen Jackson and fucking Matt Barnes, those fuckers. Got to fucking take shit from those fucks all day. Fuck. Ain't nobody saying that shit. Niggas like, where y'all going? Yeah, we fucking shit, we going to work with Matt and Jack, nigga. <laughs> we ain't really be doing shit, but just, you know, whatever the fuck. <laughs> just gonna stand right here and hold this camera for about 15, 20 minutes and inhale all this good ass yeah, smoke. Yeah, get in contact. Yeah, <laughs> zoom in and out every once in a while. And then, um, shit, then I guess I'm done. Straight up. I already know what it is, man. This is the best life. Tell me what Suge, the good and bad, uh, did on the influence of your life. The Suge Knight, I'll speak on the good because everybody know the bad. The good is that he taught ownership. He taught strength. He taught unity. He taught um, being a fucking man. Like, that's key. Being a fucking man. How about that? Mm -hmm. Like, and that goes a long way because there's a lot of motherfuckers that's not teaching you to be a man. Especially, and I'll just leave that today. there. But mm -hmm. teaching you how to be a fucking man in this industry, when this industry don't give a fuck about nobody, this industry treat everybody the same. Either you a pimp or you a hoe. Ain't no in-betweens. Mm -hmm. So for him to teach us how to be men helped us break the stigma of you're going to be a pimp or a hoe. You're going to be a man first. So you're not going to give me them bullshit-ass deals. You're not going to talk to me any way. You're not going to do me any kind of way. I'm a musician first. This is my art. This is what I love to do. <clears throat> Just like the, for, the foundation before us, the Sam Cooks, the James Browns, 
the people that fought for this shit, that own their own shit. You know what I'm saying? Like, he was one of them motherfuckers to teach us how to keep the foundation going to where you could have strong record label owners like Master P, mm -hmm. Cash Money, and any other label that came behind that Jay was Prince. able to that was able to just do their shit. Now Rapper Live was here before us. Mm -hmm. So Jay Prince was like, you know, he was in the game. Him and Uncle Luke, them niggas was in before us. Oh, yeah. But anybody after us, Suge Knight basically gave them niggas foundation on how to be how to be men in this industry. Y'all made great music together, but tell me what you and Pac's relationship was like. Because as you touched on earlier, you guys are kind of on two different paths when you guys really, really started rocking. Nah, see, when we really started rocking was before Death Row. That's how he got to Death Row. We really started rocking when, um, <clears throat> and Michael Rappaport was there when I fucking met him at the Poetic Justice Rap Party. Michael Rappaport, my dog. Yeah, Ricky Harris was the fucking like MC or the, the host that night. And I grew up with Ricky Harris. That's like my cousin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Rest in peace. So Rest in peace. When I get to the party, Ricky Harris is there, John Singleton, Janet Jackson, all of the stars and shit is there. And they got like a DJ booth and they got like a microphone. So Ricky Harris grabbed the mic and he know I get out. So he like, yeah, I got my my cousin Snoop Rock in the house and whoop, whoop, whoop. And then Pac is right here. So then when Ricky finished saying what he's saying, nigga Pac grabbed the mic and started rapping. I'm like, nigga, that was my intro. <laughs> <laughs> so when he finished saying his little blind, I grabbed the mic and I started rapping. Then he grabbed the mic and started This is one mic, nigga. This is when nigga only had one mic. So nigga had to wait patiently and kindly and didn't grab it with aggression after a nigga finished. Nigga said, so then now we rapping and rapping. So we both go about like four or five times. Then we stopped, and then my nigga Laylaw from above the law was there. And he walked us outside, and he was like, Snoop, did you meet my nigga Pac? I'm like, nah, what's up? Shook the nigga hand, nigga rolled a blunt. I'm like, nigga, what's that? He like, nigga, it's a blunt. The nigga rolled a blunt, licked that motherfucker and lit it, smoked that motherfucker. I'm like, let me get your number, come holla at you. Got his number, maybe like, a month later, I finally called him, and I'm like, what's happening? What's up with you? He like, I'm at the house. I'm frying some shrimp. Nigga, come by. He was in Encino. <laughs> nigga had a house full of niggas. He was frying shrimp. Nigga had flour and shit in his hands. This is the first time I go fuck with him. And the nigga like, you ever seen my movie? I'm like, nah, nigga, you was in a movie? He's like, yeah, nigga, I got a movie called Juice, nigga. I'm like, let me see it, cuz. And nigga gave me a big ass laser disc. That's when laser disc was out, nigga. This motherfucker was a pop. This big nigga was square. He gave me that motherfucker. I took it to the house and I and DOC had a laser disc player too. Put that motherfucker in, nigga watched Juice and fell in love with that nigga. I was like, cut this nigga hard. <laughs> me and all the homies started listening to this nigga music, getting all this shit. Me and them started hanging out, started fucking with him and fucking with him. And then I did. My record, then I did the Murder Was The Case soundtrack. And I wanted this song he had called, uh, Tell Me Do You See, Life So Hard On A Nigga When You mm. Living Like A G. G. I wanted that song bad. And he was like, nigga, I paid him 35000 I made sure give him 35000 Sugar was like, nigga, who is this nigga? We giving $35,000 to this motherfucker ain't shit. I said, man, pay the nigga, man. This nigga the shit. The song is bomb. So Suge paid him. Nigga, we didn't even use the song. <laughs> oh, my mama, we didn't use the song. Because he rapped on the song, but I wanted to rap on the song. And I was like, I was debating whether I wanted to use him. And, me, and it got too late and we didn't use it. But long story short, when he got back out and got on Death Row, I had already paid for it. So I used the song and I did the lyrics over on the... The movie that he was on before he died, The Wanted, Dead or Alive. What was the name of that movie? He played a cop, didn't he? Yeah. yeah. It wasn't Gridlock, was it? Yeah, yeah Gridlock. Gridlock. Yep. It was on that motherfucker, yeah. Gridlock. And we yeah. used it for that. But I had paid the nigga like <laughs> four <laughs> right. years before that. And this one, Suge wasn't fucking with him. Suge was like, don't get that nigga all that money. I'm like, cuz, he worth it, cuz. So he was my friend before Death Row. Uh -huh. Right? So building a brotherhood with him. So when he was locked up, 
naturally I spoke to Suge and was like, we need to get Cuz out and put him with us because he will make us better and he gonna push me and he's just the shit just because we need his spirit here. So that was the first successful free agency acquisition that I acquired with Suge Knight as like a general manager to bring Cuz to the squad and then put him on the team and say, Daz, stop dog father, get that mm. nigga everything. Mm -hmm. Man, that was the best thing that happened to him was Daz. Right? <laughs> People don't know that. Give him everything. Gave him everything. See, Daz was hungry right that time though. Cause Dre was like the man and Daz wanted, Daz has got that complex about him where he don't like being two. He want to be the one. Mm -hmm. So he couldn't come after me cause I'm his cousin. So naturally he want to come after production. So he producing hard and trying to make shit that's like on the level of Dr. Dre, if not better than Dr. Dre, or trying to get to that level. You know, that's that drive, that's that competitive spirit of having great niggas on your team. It pushes you to be great. Mm -hmm. If you got a bunch of sorry motherfuckers on your team, you gonna be sorry. Mm -hmm. That's why the teams that can't win is a look at their bench. Yeah. All them sorry motherfuckers over there. But then look at the office too. Right. Uh, N Nipsey Hussle. His legacy, what does his legacy mean to you? Nipsey leaves a legacy of gangsterism, uh, business, education, mentorship, and future. Um, just because he touched on everything that I spoke of. And he knew it. Like, we didn't know it. Wasn't nobody really knowing how deep Cuz was while he was here. We was rolling Woody. So we was enjoying the experience. Mm -hmm. So when you fully get to enjoy the experience, then you understand. Because all while we was listening, we was making our own music and we was doing other shit. So we couldn't listen like we listened to right. it when he passed away. We listened to it with a understanding because we ain't going to hear him again. So now you understanding he knew what he was saying because mm -hmm. he could have said anything. Why would he say that? Why would he write that? He knew, like we all know. When I write what I write, I wrote murder was the case before it happened. I didn't want no murder case to happen, but I knew that death was around me. So I had to write it to where I could survive. Mm -hmm. It's the only way I could write it. Everybody else was writing their death. Listen to my peers in 92 and 93. They all write about their death. Snoop Dogg, the only one that didn't die. Because he had a relationship with God. Mm -hmm. I prayed to God in that song, despite making a deal with the devil. Mm -hmm. But I prayed to God. That's game. Mm -hmm. You spoke in the past about people like yourself, Jay, Puff, really coming together, unified, and really doing some meaningful shit. Speak on that. Um, us just being together means a lot because the world don't never get a chance to see all of these black business minds collaborate. You know, we always do a song with, he may got a song with him, he did this with him, but to collaborate on some business that can last forever is important because it, it shows brotherhood and it builds something that's gonna last forever because we all don't lose. You got people that don't mm -hmm. lose coming together. That's something that's eternal. And it's not even an ego thing. It's about who's going to be man enough to say, let's do it. I always bring shit to the table. Everybody know I'm the life of the party. When I come in, I always push the line up. Let's do something together. What's your initiative so I can help you first and foremost? What you need me to do for you? All right, cool. That We got that out the way. Here's what I want to do with you. Let's get some money. Mm -hmm. How about that? Everything's just conversational. How about don't that? Get that? That's one thing that people don't know is, is how insane your hustle is and how many different things you got your hand in. And really, it's, and I've seen you in action when you're, when, when you're in the process of deals and situations. You're really just being you and opening these people's eyes up to a whole new avenue. Uh, you know, I heard you're in the tech space now. They want you to come speak at tech stuff. And, but like you said, you can't give all that game away for free. You don't know. They got to break bread or fake dead. They know it. <laughs> I need the bag and I need a piece of some of these companies in here. 
But talk and, about, and they talk about how important that is. Talk about how important that is. It's very is. important to know your brand and know your worth because a lot of times we've been used and, you know, for example, an athlete that went to a certain college or university, when he's at that university, he makes that university millions of dollars because he plays his ass off on the basketball court, the football field, he wins them a championship. He doesn't make it in the NFL or the NBA. How does that athlete continue to make money? The university ain't going to pay him because they ain't been paying him. But if he was smart, he was branding while he was at the school. He was setting up shit while he was there to position himself to when, when he finishes, the alumni, the state, the city, the community going to give him some sort of business or something to tie him into making money because he was so impactful to that position at that school that's constantly growing and getting big deals year after year. But if you ain't taught that, you only concerned with the moment. That's why I say the difference between a UCLA kid and a USC kid. The UCLA kid is always thinking futuristic and what's ahead of me. The USC kids that I've dealt with are always about the moment. And we got to break that and start thinking about how to do things together and be about us as a brotherhood and not just about the moment and what can I do for now? Now, what can I do that's going to last when I'm gone? That's the key. You think because US, uh, USC in the hood got something to do with it? I what? think USC in the hood has a lot to do with it, but I just think the mentality of the, the, the professors and the teachings and the alumni and the direction, everything runs from up top. So however the shit is ran up top, it's how it's going to get to you on the bottom. And the, the way it's ran up top at UCLA, it just feel like it's more of a brotherhood and a fraternity and we got your back and we there for you. Like, SC is, all right, what have you done for me lately? Because mm -hmm. they banned some of my niggas that won national championships. Crazy. They can't even come up there. How the fuck y'all going to do that? But I can go up there. I ain't won shit for y'all. I ain't done nothing. I ain't even went to one day of class. And my picture on the wall. Right. You know, so you using me. But the motherfucker that brought kids there and brought money there mm -hmm. don't got no action. Yeah. How, am I, how What I'm supposed to do? Be happy my face is on the wall? Give a fuck about that. I got three homeboys that went to UCLA. Him, Baron, and Rico. And I didn't made money with all of them. I all, of, all of them got something going on. All of them smart brothers. You know, so I mean, I, he, you see, he realized that you know his son came over. Yeah, I've seen him in yeah, plenty of yeah. jerseys. UCLA is blessed. Child. Box that, you know, he, that he realized <laughs> it. You know, better yeah. late than never. Yeah, yeah. we ain't tripping. So what? What would I would have went if I would have went to college, Matt? Where I would have went? SC, SC, UCLA, SC, one hundred percent. I still, used, I used to have a couple of chicks over that way. I wasn't tripping. You know what I mean? And I fucked with football. <laughs> so I feel like there's been a few points that, as fans, we know, kind of turning points in your life, you know, being acquitted of murder, um, and then the, the trip you made to Jamaica. Right. And when you came, you came out of that as, as Snoop Lion, as you say. Blessed star. Talk to me about how those experiences kind of shaped your adulthood. Well, the acquittal shaped your livelihood. You know, my wife, which was my girlfriend at the time, was pregnant with little Snoop and Spank was born. So it was me looking at, am I gonna be a part of these kids' lives? And if I do get opportunity, how am I gonna be different? How am I gonna be better? And once I did get acquitted, my whole mission was to be a better person, a better man. And if that meant cutting certain people out of my life, that's what it meant, like with a quickness. So, you know, when you got things like that where life is on the line. It's easy to make a decision. You know what I'm saying? And that was like, it was real for me, but at the same time, it was necessary. Because that's what kept me alive. Because without it, I would have went back to doing the same bullshit and probably been cut down. But realizing and, and um, making changes and being a better person I was able to create like a football league and all kind of shit from that nigga to this man, from all of that. And then the reincarnated situation, Jamaica was um, in the beginning, I just wanted to go out there and just experience something other than the hotel room. Cause I used to always go out there and just hang in the room, 
So from doing a record to being affected by the people that took me to the Nod Bingy Temple, something hit my spirit, man. It was like I came there open anyway. So I wasn't like trying to like not find nothing. I was there looking, and it found me. And uh, Rastafari was like, it was who I was. Like, you don't know who you are until you travel. And when I seen other things and seen what it was about and how it was actually who I was, it helped me to get a better vision on what I was supposed to be doing. And that was in 2011. So look at 2011, Snoop Lion, to where I'm at now, 2020. All of the great things that I've done, all of the the up the uproar of things that I've done. Bettered people. Yes. Helped. Yes. Cared. Yes. That. Tell us a little bit more about your league, because, I mean, that was something that was started. You know, I know your son played, and you didn't really like the league, and then <clears> – <throat> but just really more creating a league for neighborhoods to, to keep these kids out of trouble. And how many of your kids have gone on to professional careers? Well, the league was created in 2005 um, just because I wanted to create a league that could help out single parents and – you know, people from the hood that really didn't have a lot of money. Football was like $300 per kid to play when I started my league. So if there were three kids in one house, you're looking at about $1,000 for one parent to pay for football, not to mention cleats and mouthpieces and jerseys and all kind of extracurricular shit you got to get. So I was trying to figure a way to make a league that could have great football, have good organizations, and have a nice price connected to it, but grades was implemented. So you had to have a 2.0 GPA to play. But if you maintain a 2.0 GPA, your parents would have to pay $100 for you to play. But if there were two kids in the house, the second kid was $50. So, and this was a clause that we put in. Matt and Jack, y'all cousins. Y'all don't stay together, but Matt, mama gonna pay for you to play. Mm -hmm. So, hundred for Matt, fifty for you. Mm -hmm. That's the plan. Mm -hmm. Buck fifty. Mm -hmm. So you see how I took the price and sliced it in half, but I put grades as the initiative. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't just, oh, this nigga just making money. No, I'm making about the grades. We got to start somewhere. Two point ain't a lot, but it's it's a start. Mm -hmm. It's average. We're gonna teach you how to be average, then we're gonna teach you how to come up. Yeah, I graduated with a one point seven. But see, you got to start somewhere, though, Steve. You look like it, too. <laughs> <laughs> you got to start somewhere with these kids, though, man. And, and when I was growing up, we always used to say the, the best athletes was the dumbest. When I was a kid, it was always the dumb jock that was the best nigga on the team. He was the best athlete, but he was the dumbest motherfucker in class. He would fuck up in school. He would, wouldn't remember the plays, come to the game late. That's just what it was. So I wanted to build an era of, we want the scholastic mm -hmm. athlete. The what? The scholastic. <laughs> we, we wanted to be a scholar <laughs> and an athlete. You understand me? Oh, because I seen the game grow. Football got smart. It wasn't just pitch right, pitch left. It was schematics. Creativity. It was numbers. Mm -hmm. It was assignments. It was... And in order to win, you have to adjust. Mm -hmm. So I had to adjust as a coach. So I had to adjust with my playbook, with my football league, to give them different shit and make my league fun because Vince Staples played in my league. And this is the shit that he said that touched my heart. He was like, nigga called me Coach Snoop. Nigga said, Coach Snoop, nigga, when you let us put our names on the back of our jerseys, that was the best shit ever. Not their last names, but their sweet name, mm -hmm. whatever their hood name was. Yeah, yeah. That blew their fucking yeah. mind when I did that. That's hard. And that just was me just being a real nigga, like, yeah. this nigga named Killer. This nigga named Hitter Man. Yeah. This nigga named Man Child. Yeah. Like the XFL. Yeah. Was, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And them, oh, them, them, them kids went <coughs> crazy. Yeah. And Vince Staple, as a grown ass rapper, said, You changed my life. That's you changed dope. all of my homeboys' lives when you did that. Because we was bad as fuck, and all we wanted to do was play in your league. And one of the homies had to stand on, push cans down to get $50 to play, but he raised $50 so he could play. Mm -hmm. 
Like, it's stories like that dope. that my league was built on. That's like, that's my baby. Mm -hmm. And I got over 500 kids that then graduated from high school, over 300 that then graduated from Division I program, and over 12 that made it to the NFL. That's better than some high school. Come on, man. We've been colleges. around since 2005. Tell me what the, what the most report that that's the, obviously the most rewarding part uh, of mentoring for you is just showing them there's another way. You know what the best part in NBA? I ain't gonna lie to you is when a grown man called me coach. That shit is like the best feeling in the world, man. Because that means you meant a lot. Mm -hmm. Cause I know when I call my coach, coach, I can see how it touches his heart that I still call him mm, coach day, yeah. as a grown ass man. You know what I'm saying? Like he came to my concert the other day, right? One of my coaches. And I brought this nigga back to coach my little league team because we couldn't beat this particular team until we brought this <laughs> nigga back and then we won it all. Coach Murrow, my nigga, you know I love you. Hmm. Coach come to my show. As soon as I get off stage, this is what the nigga say. Man, you was up there for a long time, man. You need to start drinking water to hydrate. <laughs> I said, coach, I've been drinking water all day. No, I'm just saying, you need to hire. I said, that's just the coach of you, man. Mm -hmm. I'm good. This the shit I do, coach. This ain't football. This the shit's my lane, nigga. I just scored seven touchdowns, nigga. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You hear me? Yeah. I don't sweat. That's what I do. Yeah. But that is the best feeling in the world when I'm at a gas station, right? And I'm by myself at like two in the morning. And a car pull up with four niggas. And I'm scared as a motherfucker. And the niggas jump out the car. And one of the niggas like, What's up, Coach Snoop? No. <laughs> Damn. Uh, that was dope. Like, shit. God is good. Yeah, man. right? Every day. There used to be a time when that car would pull up. Oh, nigga. What's up, nigga? Oh, nigga. Where you All from, bad. homie? Yeah. <laughs> All that. See, we live to learn. You know what I mean? I'm going to smoke the rest of your joint. I done smoked all my blunt. You think what I'm saying? There you go, Jack. Thank you, I share with you. I appreciate it. I told you Proceed, you brother. Proceed. Fairy tales are make believe. The share Battle of LA. I mean, you're a die The niggas got us knows. right now. They got us right now. And I cussed. You heard I went off. Did y'all? I seen it. What? You know we saw it. But act like I ride up the locker room, too. But, so act, but we act, blew their locker room down. I, yeah, yeah, nigga. But I, <laughs> that was the sign, nigga. Get <laughs> it together. Broke their locker room out. Broke them niggas in. I rattled them, though, man, on some like, because. They got to understand what they mean to L.A., right? You niggas could go 0 and 82. Beating them niggas across the street matters more than anything. That's like Ohio State, Michigan. That's like any other rivalry in sports. Like, they mean more than the Celtics, nigga. Okay? And the Celtics got championships. But right now, they got the mouth and the... So you got to shut that at, shut that up. Mm -hmm. But I already know what the plan is. Let me hear. Let me hear, it, Coach. <laughs> when it get to May. That you hear what? What you call it, Coach? <laughs> when, when it gets to the merry month of May, we gonna see how y'all play. Mm. When we play them. Clippers got dogs. That's the only thing that's missing Fish. is the tone dogs. of the gangsterism. Yeah. That little nigga Beverly. Yeah. Oh. Adam. Oh. Goon. <laughs> Goon. I walk in the alley he with ready that to nigga. Scratch. I will go in the yes. alley with him and slap a nigga's auntie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if that's him, Patrick, yeah. bap! Now, nickel. Because he's a goon. Yeah. He takes LeBron on. That last play, ooh, that was so goonish. Like, come on, man. He's a goonie, man. Shot town. Man, you got to give him his, man. I don't like them niggas, but I love them niggas. I mean, it is what it is, man. Kawhi know what it is. I be wearing his sweatsuits and shit. Fucking with him, you understand me? But I think at the end of the day, if we both make it to the championship, the Western Conference Finals, we got something for them because like they shooting they wide out right now. Nah, see, I don't, I, I disagree. Y'all got the top record they in the West. A lot. They, they chilling. A lot. That's what they worries really not, me about really the Lakers. Not, what's they see right now? They're like three, but it don't matter. I'm with to you them. though. Three. I, I said the Lakers gonna win, but the Clippers chilling right now. They are cruising. They're, they're, we don't need to be. I, I, I didn't mean to say we. They say don't need we. to be. You honorary Clipper. You <laughs> I know, but he Clipper. take it to heart. But I'm though. an honorary Laker too. You know what I yeah. mean? So I, I just love the battle. I grew up a Laker fan, diehard Laker fan, but I really feel like 
we kind of put the Clippers back on the map. So I really took pride in right. trying to put them on the map. Live city. It'll never be. It'll never be. The Clippers will never be what the Lakers are. No matter. It just never happened. I'm gonna ask but you this: pride. Do you think this team better than Live City? <sighs> Live City was we were, tough. We were man, good. Map what I'm saying, nigga. Live City. Quit was playing. Tough, I think CP at the one. I think I think the only thing they was missing was a Lou Williams. Oh yeah. That's the only thing they was missing. Then they had but, but Croft. We had a Jamal Croft. Then they though. had Croft. The oh, that's only, only that's why, that's the only had, thing Croft we, was they, coming they, off the bench. The same exact player. The only thing we was missing was chemistry. That's what held us back. We got in our own way. Both and teams. injuries. <clears throat> yeah, because CP and Blake. Oh, we dig it. Yeah. Yeah. But I think we kept ourselves from winning. I, I, to me, that's one of the teams that should have. And the thing that I know about the Clippers that. Is gonna be effective is that that nigga Kawhi Leonard IQ so motherfucking high. Like, niggas don't even take that into the equation, but I'm a sports guy and I always have to look at that part of the game. Like, the IQ can win more than ability oh, yeah. and skill. I know, it's, it's so the mental. He, he's so sharp that he yeah. understands the dynamic of, first of all, I seen the nigga work out when I went to the finals against Golden State, right? Last year, I seen this nigga work out because I was there early. He was the only nigga on this goal. That nigga was shooting nothing but mid-range, mid-range, mid-range. I watched the next nigga come out. Three, 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 free throw, three, three. I said, oh, this nigga's smart. See, because everybody wants the three, but the mid-range is a guarantee, too. If your IQ is right, you're going to hit that mid-range more than you hit that three. Then when you want the three, it's there. It's there. Mm -hmm. That's why this nigga's so good. A lot of his intelligence and, and game smarts come, and the composure for sure come from being around Tim Duncan. So but I'm watching, I'm watching his the way he like he don't get rattled none of that. Nigga, they could be down by 15. That's Tim Duncan. That nigga pull up, hit that mid range, get back on D. Patrick Beverly didn't got a nigga to throw the ball off on his own feet. Yeah. Now they down by 11. <laughs> and they clapping and shit. And they, they, shit. Here come the bullshit. Here it come. Williams did hit a three from the corner and it fell out, and they gave him a four-point play. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my God. Ooh, ooh, this nigga ooh. with this dreadlocks look like the predator coming through the middle. <laughs> hey, we just, hey, we just, we just, we just, y'all, the Lakers need Jamal Crawford. That's who we need. They That's what they need. They need someone to get him a bucket. He can answer. Croft. He can answer. He can get him a bucket. Ooh. He can answer. Ooh. He can Ooh. I say, I say in the merry month of May, yeah, we will have an bucket. acquisition. Because I just, you feel everything it. ain't what it's supposed to be. It's something missing. Mm. It's something missing. Jay Crawford, that'll be nice. And Dwight Howard, I got to give him a shout out. Yeah, the new Dwight it. Howard, this nigga's the comeback player of the year. Or whatever that award is. For uh, am I right or wrong? Most improved. Most, yeah, that's what I'm saying. That shit. From what he, the way he looked last year to now. Yeah, he went through a lot last year. He looked good. You mean last time he was with the Lakers? Not even that. When I seen him with the Hawks and the, all the other sorry teams, he he looked bad. He looked amazing right now. His spirit, his look, his rebound, his defense, like that nigga is the shit. I watched the Lakers, nigga. That's yeah. my squad, and then, and, and then too. What a lot of people won't tell y'all, he going in the game playing against the second unit. Ain't no second unit and, and no league can stop Dwight Howard. So that's another reason why he's shining. He's playing against the second. He's he, he can dominate against starters. It looked like he on our planet now. <laughs> he might be. He might have checked the in. Way he, he the might. way he playing? Yeah, he might be. Why he may he be in our stratosphere. I think he it works this for everybody. Was, this was I'm just, because yeah. I can't see that just natural, just Evolution. wake up in my game change. Overnight. I think he just had one of those, oh. Yeah. Welcome to the friendly skies. Yeah. You will be flying at an all-time high. All-time high. But it was redemption. I, I think he knew this is his last chance. You know what I mean? It, he it looked good. I'm happy for him. Right. I'm proud of him. I love him. I loved him when he came the first time. I love him more on the second side. Good shit, D. White. That's what's up. What should have been your most favorite Laker moment as a, as, as oh, just growing man. up as a fan? You know what? One of them is this, right? When the Lakers won, right? Them niggas won. I think they beat the Trailblazers in that game. And uh, when when to Kobe go to the finals? threw that motherfucker up and yeah. Shaq caught that motherfucker, nigga, me and my homeboys kicked the locker room. We kicked it in, nigga, and went in there with them, nigga, <laughs> and busted in, nigga, and came in that motherfucker and was doing interviews with Jim Hill and all kind of niggas. We was excited <laughs> like a motherfucker. Because that's when Shaq was the realest nigga in the world. He'd leave tickets at the thing for a nigga. And he would leave one wristband. And he'd be like, 
When you get the wristband, just take it off and give it to the next person to come in. <laughs> and that's how we used to get out. Like, that's when the Skype and whatever that shit was, I think it was Skype page or a Skyping or something. And I used to always hit the nigga, Big Daddy, I need some tickets to the game. And this was the big game against the Trailblazers. And them niggas, when them niggas won, we came in that locker room and it was just like, we was a part of the team. And Phil Jackson was looking at us like we was crazy in the motherfucker. He was looking like, how did these niggas get in here? <laughs> we was like, nigga, we, we, we what the niggas. <laughs> That's how we got in. And they won that motherfucker. That was like, because... What was that, 2001? Yeah, all of them other championship yeah. moments was like I was just a fan. That shit felt like I was, was on the team. team. Yeah. And then, let me, let me stop lying. When they beat New Jersey, game four, they swept they dog head asses. And we was in New Jersey, and, and, and Jay-Z was there, and all kind of New York niggas was there. And me and Nate Dog, we had flow seats, nigga. We was on the flow, nigga. Me and Nate Dog. And we watched them count that shit down. Ten, nine, eight. And the Los Angeles Lakers are the 2003 time defending. Give me the ball. Nigga Shaq threw me the ball. Tried to run out with the ball. <laughs> nigga chased me down. Hey, that's property of the NBA. Nigga, fuck y'all. Nigga Shaq gave me this shit. Right word. <laughs> I'm gonna fight this nigga over the ball, man. This nigga tussling and shit. <laughs> Shaq said, give it to him, big homie. I'll get you another one. <laughs> Motherfuckers. Well, people, we, we appreciate because when you came and started riding with that We Believe team. Yeah. And we, we had a lot of fun times down there when we had beat... Uh, man, y'all niggas was representing California. Straight yeah, up. show sure pulled up. Man, please. Y'all was representing Golden State, California. And I liked the way y'all played. And y'all spirit was like... It was like mine. Like, I fuck with y'all. That was a hell of a team y'all had, too. Hell of a well, ride. I had, I had brought him down to perform my birthday party, though, remember? Yeah. Around that time, too. Uh-huh. He Which he showed like love, stayed on. He's supposed to do actually 30 minutes. Let me tell you how I really kept it. He was supposed <laughs> to be on the stage 30 minutes. He ended up being on almost three hours. Yeah, he rocked that and, shit. And his, in, in his rider, he wanted a uh, PlayStation in the back with games and food and all that. We left all that. This motherfucker took my Xbox, though. <laughs> <laughs> you know what we said? <laughs> nigga so say, nigga <laughs> say, cuz that nigga Steven Jackson drink a lot of Hennessy, cuz. How could be hitting all in threes and be hitting out like that? <laughs> Like, that nigga's a G, nigga. That nigga out there man. hennied out, hitting threes on y'all niggas talking shit, ready to fight with every and anybody. So we go, we going so we gonna do a, uh, it's dope, we gonna add an animation, animation part to this, so by the time we gonna make all this shit work, so we gonna animate the night we beat Dallas in Golden State, and we ended up at your hotel at the Ritz. Ooh, you remember that? Boy, do I ever. We had crazy. some strong conversations that night. Deep. Too. Hold on, but let me let me let, but let me tell you how this, this started. You sitting at a desk with a fifty box of swishers. We want swishers then. Oh, yeah. You had a fifty box. You bust it down, don't roll it, it, hit it, pass it, pass it to him, and then we one. go around, roll another. You did it for about an hour and a half. <laughs> we were double fisted. And we didn't move. My sister was so hot. My sister didn't smoke. She was so hot she passed out. Remember we was watching uh, Yeah, you, sis was in there. You had the blue carpet treatment cartoons. Yeah, my movie. They just came Remember? Out. Yeah, yeah, just and you were show, No, you hadn't put it out yet. You were showing us it. I let y'all see the rough. Yeah. Was that like shit was hard. What, what, what did the hotel people do? Bro. The hotel, so the hotel people come banging on the door, and we as athletes were like, fuck. Like, we, we always nervous. trying to prep. I mean, we, we in the season still, so we thinking like, oh, shit, here we go. They come in. Hey, Snoop. Good game, fellas. You guys did your thing. Da, da, da. They unscrew the windows, lift the windows up just so the smoke can go out. Ask us if we need anything. We all leave. looking like, is like, this what the real? Fuck? Yeah, <laughs> VIP. <laughs> That's when Stern was the president. Five star <laughs> hotel, <laughs> man. They come and open Me windows. Me and Stern had an understanding. Yo, <laughs> they came and unscrewed the windows at the wrist. But the whole night was crazy. So we beat Dallas. But we were the only team smoking. Wasn't Nelson like that, y'all coach? Me. Yeah, we, we was smoking burning. hard. Nigga, I seen a. Uh, HBO special on that nigga blowing like a broke stove. That nigga grow weed. <laughs> Nelly Kush. I'm like, Kush, that's why this nigga, I love this Nelly nigga, Kush. Kush. Yeah. But that night, so we beat them. So we go back to Jack's apartment and we start doing what we do. So we drink and smoke and celebrate. And then Nelly lives on the top floor. So we go up to Nelly's uh, penthouse. He got a gang of people in there. We come in there. As soon as he come in, uh, Jack, hey, fellas, uh, Woody, uh, Woody Harrelson's in the back rolling doobies. And we look at each other like, what? Our motherfucking coach telling us someone's in the back rolling weed. So we go out there and start smoking with him. 
no, what no NBA team doing like Come that? Come on, dog. man. Man, because... Don Nelson coached in the seventies, nigga. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember seeing that nigga on the sideline in the seventies, nigga. That nigga's hard, cause I wanna meet, I wanna hang out with y'all, coach, man. Yeah. Wait, we gonna take a trip out there? Can you we do that? Yeah, I want to showtime. Yeah, I want to tell you try the Nelly Kush. Hey, I want to try the Nelly Kush. Yeah. This is big Snoop Dogg. I want to give you the five star green thumbs of approval, so that way you can be official like a referee with a whistle. Yeah. No, we, we we doing the uh, the we believe doc and everything. So just come with us out there. Fuck with us. Man, man, come awesome. on, man. I seen his get out, man. I mean, you was there. I doing got the his hair in the ponytail, looking fly as a motherfucker, old Nelly. How loud, how loud was that place, though? Let me tell you. That game six. This is pre-Steph Curry and them. Y'all had that motherfucker Rocking. lit. And they was blowing in there, like, too. Nigga, it was, it was major during the blowing. Game, it was smoking during the it game. Was you could smell blood on the way in that motherfucker. <laughs> it was so lit, nigga. That was Oakland, California, hey, nigga. You hear me? Peace, Oracle. That shit was so loud, because I know my dad used to tell me, he's like, you know, all these white people out here smoking cigarettes. I'm out here just smoking my joint. They don't even bother me. <laughs> <laughs> they was special, man. They was special, man. That was, man. I hung out with the owner's kids, man. The two little dudes. I let him wear my little chain. I had oh, my that's little, right. Yeah, yeah. I, I gave him my shit. chain, man. Yeah. I let him wear the chain. Well, and that everything. shit was fun. We star studied that shit out. Man, hey, uh, so let's try trans- um, the current state of the NBA. What you think about the league right now? You know, we play like a lot of us. They always be like, man, y'all older guys hating. I don't think the game is physical. I don't think guys care as much. I know what I had to do to get to the NBA. Second to last draft pick. I know how we going overseas and all this shit. I know what I had to do. I know what the game meant to me. And I know how me and Matt played the game. Until we couldn't play it no more. We played it with a certain passion. Um, the game has grew a lot, you know, thanks to LeBron, where guys getting paid a lot of money. You know, the game they have in the day where they can choose where they want to play. But the competition, it seems like, and the, and, and, and the fight to win, it seems like it's kind of drifting away. What, what, what is your, uh, what, how do you think the game, the state of the game is right now? Do you think it's like, is in a good place or should it go back to the old type of style, like the rough style guys showing they care more about the game? I, I I started watching basketball in the seventies, cause so, you know, a fight come with that. Man, please. <laughs> right. I watched Kareem and them niggas getting a fight and didn't get suspended, nigga. Crazy. Came right back, nigga. Sat down for a commercial, nigga. Check her and we'll be right back, <laughs> nigga. nigga right, right back in the game, nigga, for real. <laughs> These motherfuckers be getting. Man, I just I just don't know, man. Like I say. And another thing, and I be wanting to speak on is like they be putting too much on some of these new players, man. Like they good, but they not that good. Yeah. When they was talking about Luka Doncic being the best twenty year old, that rubbed me the wrong way. For one, Moses Malone came out of high school. You did. And nigga, you ain't nowhere near Moses Malone, motherfucker. At Moses Malone averaged a double double, nigga, with the Houston Rockets. Don't get it fucked up. Then he came to Philadelphia and beat us four games to none mm-hmm. with Kareem and Magic. Mm-hmm. Took them to the prime. I cried like a fucking baby in 1984. Nigga, he broke my heart. Nigga made me cry. At, at 20. No, he wasn't 20 years old, but I I'm saying he came in the league at 20. Yeah. I didn't see him at 20. But when I seen him do what he did, I could imagine what the nigga was doing at 20. Mm-hmm. And the league was harder back then. Mm-hmm. That's one thing I'll definitely give it to. Is, is you see what I'm saying? Starting back then, definitely, but even up until kind of we almost stopped was it was just a much more physical, tougher to get it done I think the fight game. that y'all niggas had at the Palace made them soften the league up. It changed and, the dress code and, and, and I'm just going to speak on it because the league was real until that point. Like, shit, motherfucker, get into a squad. It is what it is. I mean, you know, fuck it. And I may see you after this and fuck your ass up, nigga. Mm-hmm. It is what it is. Where's the bus? It's what it's. If you bought that life, that's what it's about. After that, scared them. They start. If you jump off the sideline, you get suspended for three games. Which fucked the, the uh, first the Phoenix Suns when they came San off Antonio. the sideline. Yep. Like you, you softening the game up. He come through the lane. The 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 the, the, the was it the Jordan rule at first, man? That, damn, man. <laughs> damn. <laughs> Like, they soften this shit up. Like, come on, man. Like, make this shit what it used to be. It's the same for football. It's like they softening that up. It's like you got to leave this shit for what it is. But what I do like about the NBA is that the players are in control. I like that point. Mm-hmm. Because to have control means everything. And their voice is heard. Mm-hmm. They not, like, shut up, nigga, mm-hmm. and, and throw the ball. Nah. 
You tell me to shut up and dribble, nigga. I may dribble up on your ass for the TV show and all kind of shit that's <laughs> right. going, yeah, yeah. you better leave me alone. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, that's the plus to it all. And then y'all got a motherfucking commissioner that's flexible, that's like, all right, he in there with y'all. He was taught by the best. Mm -hmm. So you know how to do it and how not right. to do it. Nigga, get up in there and mix it up and get, get an understanding. Mm -hmm. Get fly with this shit. Let it be about the players. Let, let the players grow the league. Let the players be the stars. Let them shine. Let them be the voice of the league. Whatever views that they got, match that. If they got social injustice, you match that. Mm -hmm. Whatever, match that. Get on it. Get on it with a quickness. Because y'all generate a lot of money. Y'all make on, a lot man. of motherfuckers want to be no a part worries. of this shit. Come the platform, on. The platform is huge. Now, the next step is taking marijuana out like baseball did. Mm -hmm. Because baseball got smart and said, well, ain't nobody really hitting 75 home runs for smoking a joint. Mm -hmm. Now, these steroids nigga may hit 137 home runs. Mm -hmm. And be a different color in four or five years. Sammy. Head, you know head size. God damn. Uh, Bleached your whole life. Toy Story head ass nigga. <laughs> <laughs> but my whole thing it, with that thing, it, it's not even so much that Major League Baseball says smoke weed. They just stopped testing for it. I think the NBA is worried about their image. Like oh, we're sending the wrong message, but it's not even. But see, the, the image wrong is message. the image is this: when players like yourself and you, and players can admit to, hey, when I played, I smoked. Like a mom. And it actually tell, helped me. Tell your story. And that's why I'm able to story. speak in my right mind and conduct business and have a show and have other businesses because I didn't get addicted to opioids and none of the other shit that y'all was trying to give me. So now I'm able to conduct a regular life and raise kids and still have babies after mm -hmm. I get out the league because I didn't fuck my shit up and mm -hmm. throw my shit off and I'm able to still be a productive That's citizen right. without my sport that made me so much money mm -hmm. and not being addicted to nothing that's connected right. to the sport. Mm-hmm. Who's your favorite player to watch outside of Lakers? Like we know, you know, you're a big Laker fan. Who's who's someone you watch outside of the Lakers? Damn, um, I like that new nigga from Memphis, Morant. He cold. He cold. He he, he little, game. but he cold. Got a lot of game. I like his heart. Like you can't buy heart. Like you know what I'm saying. Like you can't buy that. You gotta be born mm -hmm. with it. Like and when you got that in you. That go a long way. Mm -hmm. Like when they put some goons around him or ship him out of there and get him somewhere else. It's going to be a problem. He nasty. He like how Kemba Walker look in uh, Boston. You know, I like you put him on the team with some niggas that can get out. Mm -hmm. Now he look good now. Yeah. And I sat out there struggling every night to try to beat five niggas by himself. He put up to the big three championship. Yeah. Who that? You. Always. Like, can you, I want you to please tell them. You're from when you walked out the arena to the back to the locker rooms, please tell them because you stopped somewhere else before you got to me. <laughs> Let them know how you know your well, steps on the way to my locker room. Well, when I walked out, the first locker room I seen was the the victorious team, and they was in there popping champagne and pouring champagne on each other. So I was like, I'm dressed too fly for this shit. <laughs> so as I continued to walk, <laughs> my toucan Sam nose of mine. My nose always knows because your nose knows. Uh. It was like, hold on, we need to go down this way. It smelled like we need to be in this area. So we walking and walking. And then somebody say, hey, my nigga Jack and him in there. Oh, that's all I need to hear. <laughs> I go in there with them, a couple of little bitties in there. We get the little bitties out there, take a picture with them, smile, bitch. Get gone now. <laughs> it's time to be grown. Chass out of here. Get them out of there. And then we commence to... Fire in the Clippers locker room. Woo, 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 woo. Fire. But we All had, in we had the losing room. team, but we had the championship locker room. It was a, it was a motion too. It was a feeling. Remember the CEO came in there? Yeah, the, yeah, that was dope too. Now, you hey made, man, you made me feel how deep that Come moment on, was. Come on, nigga. You know, in the locker room, we, we was on a losing team, and uh, you know we all are talking, but CEO Q come in there with his wife, right? And just tell me how much they appreciate everything I've done for the league and what I give to the league. And that, that meant a lot because we just lost. Right. You know what I'm saying? But for Cube to bring his wife right. in the shot, you know what I'm saying? That meant a lot. And, you know, he was there to see that moment. You helped the league win. Oh, there's yeah. no question. You that was the that. key. The, that the overall picture was you brought a league up because of the way you play, the way you handle your business, the way you committed to it. Mm -hmm. You make it easy for the next 
a retired athlete to say, let me go try that shit. Because mm-hmm. I was in Arizona, thanks to Matt, with my nigga Easy Rider. And I was like, JR, cuz, you need to get in the big three. He's like, you think Cube would have me? Hell yeah. I said, nigga, <laughs> Cube. This nigga JR Ryder with the, and Cube said, tell him to come to the combine. Yeah, that's it. Nigga, and you going to get picked, nigga. Come on, man. You JR, nigga. Nigga, show up and show out. Nigga, I miss you, nigga. It's in and him. the league is you. It's in him. The league is us. It's like, it's, it's the rebirth of you niggas, man. His game. So and you can that. have your gray shit, nigga, Katino, Mobley, and motherfucking <laughs> Mahmoud. Niggas out there grayed up. Nigga, go. Yeah. Mahmoud 50. This us. Hoop it. Hoop it. Hoop it. Nigga, this is us, nigga. We can't hide that shit. This us. Yeah. MJ or Kobe? Kobe, man. <laughs> All-time greatest? All-time hey, man, greatest. I'm a Laker, man. All-time greatest, Magic. Okay. Give me your top, give me your top five, then. Magic, Kareem, Kobe. Jordan, Shaq. That's your all-time top five. So LeBron's on number six, maybe further back. You Will. Oh, okay. So Will got to come. <laughs> Will, nigga, the six man got to have these Still, on. So he coming yeah. in here like just dogging <laughs> niggas out. Yeah. Who yeah. can deal with that off the bench? Yeah, yeah. And then LeBron. You go, Will, LeBron. That's nice backup right there, mm-hmm. sixth, seventh man. In case Magic need a breather. But he gonna do it all. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, man, With that it. run, man, please. <laughs> On NBA 2K, you can have it like that. <laughs> <laughs> With your longevity in, in in being an entertainer, what's been the secret of maintaining a relationship? With uh, for your your family dynamic, what's been the secret? Nothing's perfect. Everything is up and down. But tell me what would have been your tricks to to maintain. Just trying to keep them involved. Um, with my family, I try to like, this shit is like a juggling act. And if you got a family, you understand what I mean. From the mother to the kids to the grandparents to the siblings and all of the shit that come along with it. I just try to keep them all attached, like in some form or fashion. That's why I built the compound. Because that was my way of saying, how can I have something that's all of Everybody. ours? That's an epicenter that we can always come to. If we need to get away, if we need to talk, we need to cry, laugh, make music, videos, party, whatever, this is it. And I had to build that because for a moment, I only had that. You know what I'm saying? And they had to get in where they fit in based off of you know, my plays. But to be a better family man, a better businessman, you build shit for the family and for the business. So that's why I built the compound and that's why the family has been executing on the level that we have for so many years, considering that I have an epicenter where we can do that, where we can chop it up and get it right when it's wrong. Me and you personally spoke, because I was real, I was a football player first and just loved your son's <laughs> athletic ability. Excuse me. <clears throat> you, said you, you said you what? <laughs> you questioned my football ability? No, no, no. I, I, I didn't hear you. I, just, the, I had to cough. I had records. to cough. Check all the records. I had to cough. Anyway. Fuck out of here. <laughs> Check them. Replacements. Hell yeah, duh. I was on stop on the football field. Wow, we guess. got plenty of people that can speak to that. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, as I was saying, we was talking about your son playing, going to UCLA, playing football, and then him stepping away from it because it wasn't really what he wanted. Talk to me a little bit about that. Ooh, that was a heavy one in the beginning because, um, you know, as a father... You know, you you live through your kids. Ain't no other way around it. Especially if you didn't make it in sports and your kids making it in sports. You basically, you are them. You living for them, with them, and you are them. So when he makes it, we make it. And for him to get to that level of going to a Division One program where Jim Moore and you know, Coach Yarbs all came and recruited him and, you know, got him there. And it's like he's projected to do so many great things and then don't even show up to the first practice and just nowhere to be found. You was excited about it. And I was so excited, even though he chose that school, but I was excited for him because he was going to do his thing. 
And I knew that when he chose that school, he was going to have longevity after football. Mm-hmm. So he don't show up, shit going bad. We like six, seven days into the first week of camp. Finally sit down and catch up to him. And it's like a burden is off his shoulders when he say what he say to me. Like, in so many words, I've been playing for you my whole life. Mm-hmm. Mm. Like, and he had. I coached him since he was six years old. I made that nigga play. Mm-hmm. Get your ass out here. And he became good. But I was, I always say in daddy ball, you either gonna make your son the greatest athlete in the world or either gonna hate the fuck out of you. Mm-hmm. Ain't no in betweens. And I made him the greatest athlete in the world that I could. And I began, I began to see he was gonna hate me. So him pulling back made us do this. Cause football was gonna do this. Mm, I pray, child. This brought us here mm-hmm. to where now I gotta support you. Not what you doing, but support you. No matter what you doing. And then I got got to a point to where I seen that he needed me as a kid. Mm-hmm. So what, he's 6'2", 180 pounds, look like a grown-ass nigga on Sunday? He a kid. Them your babies, Matt, when they grow up, like they getting taller, they still them little bitty babies that cry and do all that soft shit, they babies. Mm -hmm. And it's like no matter how big they get, you got to always remember that. So I had to keep that in mind and not be mean but be understanding and say, I got you. Now live your life. Mm -hmm. What you want to do? I got you. Now I got to pay <laughs> for your ass to go to UCLA when you had a full scholarship. <laughs> but I got you. Mm-hmm. How much is this shit? God damn. You sure you don't want to go to a community college? Right. <laughs> <laughs> nigga, something. That's interesting hearing, though, because I coach my boys, but one thing I learned early to, it was to never pressure them to do, you know, I made it. I played my, my, my I spent my 15 years you enjoyed the ride. You saw what it was about, but it's always on your time. So if you want to work out, we can work out. If you don't want to work out, if you want to be good, you want to be better, you want to continue to improve, it's on you. And it finally just turned 11, and they finally, Dad, let's go shoot. <laughs> Dad, let's go dribble. Let's 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 go do this. Let's go play. And it, it made me feel good because, like I said, I was never going to push them. So, so, well, so Matt, I the... coached Cordell at 6 years old and 7 years old. At 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, I stopped coaching him. He was on my team. <laughs> But I never talked to him. He played wide receiver and he played defensive end. Only time I would talk to him is if I would give him the signal to run the nine route or to run the slant route. I wouldn't talk to him at all because I seen that he was better getting coached by somebody else. Mm -hmm. We talked about that. And he was better just being my son. Mm -hmm. On the ride home, we was on some like. They want you to be their homeboy. Yeah, nigga, what you want? You want Baja Fresh, nigga, or what? Or mm-hmm. uh, Burger King? <laughs> what you want, nigga? <laughs> nigga don't want to hear, hey, nigga, you know you were supposed right. to catch that ball, nigga. Yeah. That X route you ran was wrong, nigga. I told you the Y, 4, 5, 6, 2, 3, XL, left 2, 3, 5, 6, and that. <laughs> the fuck is all these numbers? Shut the fuck up. Practice is over with, I nigga. What's your top three movies all time? Mm-hmm. The Mac. Motherfucker, can you buy that? Yes, sir. Don't make me go in the cabin. <laughs> yes, sir. Get, get into it, Jesse. Nah, I'm cool. I'm cool. I ain't gonna do it right now. Uh, let's see right what now. two is. Godfather. Mm. And it's got to be an Eddie Murphy movie because it's probably gonna be Trading Places or Forty Eight Hours. Classic. Top three movies you played in. Uh, the roles you liked. Training Day, uh, Starsky and Hutch, and Bones, because I got to. That was your thing. I you was in the to, wheelchair on Training Day? Yeah. yeah but, he said, was, he said put that I, nigga I on the front seat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was Training Day. Well, Bones, I got to, to be uh, with Pam Greer. You understand mm-hmm. me, nigga? Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. Pam, man, hey. Man, man, please. That was your crush. You know what that she means? Sheba, baby. Man, man please. Who would, who would play you in your life story? Fuck. I don't know, maybe some young actor that's fly as a motherfucker that's up up and coming. I don't know right now. I would say Wesley Snipes, but that nigga too chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> Biggest regret up to this point. Biggest regret. 
I have none. No I regrets. It. I love it. Mm. Deep. How old are you right now? 49. Yeah, you getting old, bro. Almost yeah. at 50. What are we doing for 50? I don't Where know, we going? Baby. I'm about to be 40 in March, bro. I'm going to let all my shit go great, because I'm going to see what it look like. You going to stop dying it? I ain't dying it. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I haven't done. Don't my do it. They won't do it. I'm like, hell no, your shit look burgundy, Don't nigga. Don't do it. Don't you do didn't dye your shit. You over here looking like burgundy, <laughs> nigga. <laughs> Real quick before we finish up, you're kind of the poster boy. You've been telling us this shit before '92 about weed and what it does and the powers. What do you think of the state of cannabis right now that is starting to legalize and all the shit that come with it? I'm so happy for the awareness of cannabis and how cool. it's becoming. So necessary, so relevant, the topic of discussion, so many bars, dispensaries, so many states, cities, um, so many politicians. It's like the, a great discussion. It's great for health benefits. It's saving a lot of people. It's keeping people here. It's keeping our sanity level right. Preach. Um, I think if the motherfucking president smoked some dope or smoked some weed, Preach. he wouldn't act like he was on dope. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? So... With that being said, the growth and how it's growing and becoming a vehicle, I'm happy at that, but I would like to see all of my niggas that's locked up for right. weed to be released yeah. ASAP, like right now, like just because. Like why not? Right. Not why. We the NBA version of you because everywhere we go, we smoke. Always. Yeah, we, we, gonna, we, we was gonna, raised on you. We figure it out. We was raised on. And Wiz was raised on me, too, because this nigga's crazy. Uh, shout out Wiz. Like, I, I, you know, right, as you get older, you start getting, like, nice, right? So I done got older and nice. So we had a friend of ours wedding in Turks and Caicos in a whole nother country, right? So I got weed, but I'm trying to be. It's a wedding. It's, you know, it's my, my white homegirl. There's a lot of white people there, so I don't just want to act a nigga just coming in. <laughs> so I come in, I, me and my wife and my daughter, we sitting down being respectable and, hey, how are you guys doing? Hey, what's going on? Hey, Snoop, hey, hey, how are you? Hey, what's going on? <laughs> All that bullshit. Hey, this nigga Wiz walk in. <sighs> walk right to me. What's up, Aunt? <laughs> I'm like, hey, man, I'm trying to be different today. <laughs> oh, fuck it. You just going to turn me out like that, huh? Like now everybody looking at me like, we thought you were better than that. Well, fuck it. He brought the shit in. Like, but that's a product of what I've I've raised. Shout out to Wiz. <laughs> <laughs> what would the 49-year-old you tell the 21-year-old you about this game? Oh, man. I would have uh, been a little bit more selective with the people that I put in positions of power. Mm. <laughs> like, that's very key. Like, to give people power, everybody don't deserve it. Mm. That should be earned. When you earn it, you get it. If somebody give it to you, it's really, like, mis misused or, or it's abused. It's easy to abuse it, yeah. Yeah, that's what I learned. Last question. What do you know for sure? That uh, Snoop Dogg gonna live forever. Mm. That's a great way to wrap it. What do you know for sure? I'm about to smoke as soon as we get dinner, uh, finished. <laughs> what you know for sure? I'm going to make 10 million in 2020. Take 10 minutes. Can I get some? Whatever you need. Hey, man, that's a wrap. Hey, we want all the smoke. All of it. Man, we appreciate Snoop for coming through. It's, Showtime. Uh, D.O. Double. Hey, man, shout out to the Showtime executives for um, being uh, smoke friendly. Appreciate y'all. And now you got You said you come with us to uh, to Maui to fuck with uh, Nelly. We on the way. I'm coming oh. to fuck with you, boy. Hey, I normally have a begging oh, segment. A begging but session. Yeah. What I, you want? Hold on. Just, no. This is a different one. <laughs> Snoop. So I, I, you know why I came back from nothing? Remember last time I seen you? What you blessed me with? Did I hit you up? A grocery bag. Did I hit you? So I'm good. Did I we hit good. You right? We good. So no begging. No today? begging today. First time ever. First time. First show. First show ever. Jack, what my grocery bags look like? Uh, hefty scent sacks. Okay. With the green tie, the big ones. Talk to him. <laughs> like a real garbage yeah, bag. Yeah, and I took it all home. Yeah, talk back. <laughs> It'll talk back. So well, how I, much I, it cost, though? Huh? How much it cost? Three ninety nine. Well, like, like and that hot mic street out? prices are, are, are dispensary prices because I know both. No. What did you pay? Oh, I pay. I didn't pay a dime. That's, a, that's what the fuck I want. I didn't pay a dime. That's so that's why I, the beggar segment is getting canceled today. 
Free 99, that's what we call it. <laughs> Man, that's a wrap. We want to thank our guest, Snoop. My brother, Jack. We had another one. Did it again. Yes, sir, brother. 2020. All the smoke. 2020 Takeover. Showtime YouTube basketball channel. Yes, sir. And all platforms streaming podcasts. All of them. Mo Monroe is wanted for the financial terrorist attack Black Monday. Black Monday was my idea. It's me, Wizard Wall Street himself. Mo is back, baby.